Hey, good morning or afternoon or evening. I'm uh, Chase Cunningham or Dr. Cunningham or Dr. Trust, whatever, uh, doing another podcast. We're actually out here in Las Vegas in an undisclosed location. Jeff Halstead. Jeff, see who you are and what you do. Hey, uh, Chase, great to be here. Uh, Jeff Halstead, I'm co-founder, chief product officer for Faction Networks, and we do zero trust networking. We call it zero trust for the rest of us. So true zero trust security for networking, data, and all these OT and IoT devices we've connected to the internet that we never should have. So when you say we never should have connected them to the internet, like extrapolate that, like I know I'm leading the witness, but I want to yep, get your yep. perspective on what that actually means. Yeah, so we're, we're talking here about, you know, to run down the list, there's really three categories, like legacy machines, you know, you, you got factories, floors with million dollar devices that are running on Windows NT and the guys who wrote the code are either retired or dead and they can't be upgraded, right? So you're sticking it behind something that you can't protect itself, right? You've got IoT, which by definition doesn't have the resources, operational technology, which encompasses a huge range of things, but it always boils down to the same thing. These devices on their own are not capable of protecting themselves. So what do we do? Really what we have available today is we put them behind VPNs and firewalls, yet everybody in the cybersecurity industry will tell you that VPNs and firewalls are not going to protect you from any of the kinds of hostile threat actors we have out there today. I mean, the, the issue that you guys, and correct me if I'm wrong, are, are really, you're going a level beyond just the typical software problem. And I want, I want people to understand how much of an uphill battle that's been, right? You guys are actually literally working on building technology hardware in the United States. Like describe just how difficult that process has yeah. been to get to that. And, and also like talk a little bit about, you know, when you're talking to investors and business people and whatever, just the the conversations that occur there. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so here's the thing, right? We we believe we call ourselves true zero trust because, you know, we look at the zero trust landscape today, most players, not all, believe that they can trust their own cloud, right? Or they can trust their own employees or they can trust your employees. And what repeated failures over and over and over again have shown us is that is not true, right? That's an assumption that is patently false keeps failing. Nobody wants to change it. We well, So what we did was architect a way to build zero trust networks that's completely decentralized. So you cannot hack faction networks, our servers, our employees, our staff. We know nothing about these networks. They are created on endpoint devices by encryption keys created by the network owner. The networks themselves are not addressable on the internet, so you can only reach it from the inside. So there is no vector to attack us or anything in the cloud to get inside a faction network. So we call that true zero trust, right? Uh, but then we ran into the kind of final frontier of zero trust, which is the hardware. So part of our solution, a crucial part, we call a pod or a portal, right? And a pod or a portal is electromechanically a router, but it can only route to one network in the world, which is this decentralized, fully secure faction network you've created. So good, good solution, because now on the local area side, whether it's Ethernet or whatever you want to use, it's a router. You can connect up with all the things the same way, no pain, no fuss, no muss. But on the internet side, it only routes to one place. So you don't need a firewall. It's not on the internet, right? So, okay, so now you've got an ability to very easily, flexibly put all these other devices that never should have been on the internet, get them the hell off the internet again and into a secure infrastructure that you control. And then you can start to say, well, what do they really need to connect to out there in the cloud? And it's almost always a very short list, right? So we spend about nine months, you know, working and doing development, working with uh, off-the-shelf routers, but having researched and found, you know, really three providers that didn't manufacture in China. Because as we know, all know, everything coming from China is part of a side of a warfare operation that they've been, you know, and launching. The last says. Decade. It is backdoor, you know, so, or untrustable. Okay, so you got to find, you know, routers not made in China. It's a very short list. And when we got done development and sent these routers off to a, a lab that we work with that does a chip off analysis for the secret service in the NSA, they came back with 67 CVEs and seven of those were level nine and above. On so everything or on Remotely each exploitable one. underneath, you know, all your firmware uh, can deliver payloads. And that's when we realized, you know, oh shit, you know, we got to do the hardware too. And believe me, that was not a popular, you know, uh, thing when we talked to investors. Yeah, I mean, the investors, they're looking for quick, easy, throw the money in there, pump and dump and kind of do that. But you guys, I mean, we're, you're taking this to the step of made in America cyber pretty fair statement, right? Yeah, made in America is a requirement, but not sufficient, right? So yes, okay. So now what we're saying and, you know, asking the industry to wake up to, right, is that, look, if the routers you're running on, right, can't be trusted, then everything else you're doing 
AI is great. All the active layers, these are important. We need that defense as well. But we have to go back to first principles and actually have secure infrastructure, right, for networking. And that networking infrastructure relies on hardware. And nobody in the industry wants to talk about or even deal with the hardware yet. That, you know, like hardware is not sexy, I guess. It's not sexy, but it's essential. It makes everything work. If we don't deal with it, then we're never going to solve the problem. And we wanted to solve the problem. Right? We were not willing to go to market with another software only solution that couldn't actually secure these kinds of critical devices. Because, you know, a decade ago, we were talking about your cameras and your printers. Now we're talking about critical manufacturing, healthcare equipment, infrastructure, my mother's pacemaker, right? When this stuff gets hacked, uh, businesses die or people die, right? Yeah. And we know that there's a hostile actor out there that has exactly that intention. Are, are you guys on the journey being affected by the tariff things that are going on back and forth or is the chip problem, you know, that I guess somebody would probably say, well, okay, even if we do the hardware and whatever else, like the chips are going to come from Taiwan. Yeah. How's that problem solved? So there's good news here. I mean, obviously the reason that we believed and stuck with it and made this decision a year ago is we believe, you know, we're at a kind of a point of tectonic shifts going on, right? So obviously you've got a president that is, is completely changing the global trade order and congressional political will behind that, right? That is really focused on reshoring to America. So yes, the first criteria was we need to manufacture back here. I mean, if we're going to have secure routers, we have to control their production. Uh, but we also have to get to the supply chain. Now, the good news is that uh, supply chain of routers, in particular chips, like we've had you know, about a decade of investment now, microchips. So we, you know, we can build on top of that. And the good news is that, you know, again, routers are not sexy. So almost all these chips, you know, they're not made, you know, they're made in, in, in a lot of them are actually made here, like global foundries up in Malta, New York, makes a lot of the RF chips that we would use. And so we've been working closely with, in New York State, with what's called Go Semi, which is the governor's office, which has been deploying the the micro the chips act money and you know the, the, there's a very good path for us say by 2027 to get to 100 percent made in usa chips and components right so we really routers are the low-hanging fruit i mean it's it's one of the most critical pieces it's one of the most achievable things we can do um it's it's a great economic opportunity because you're talking about 16 billion dollars of wi-fi and edge routers in the u.s of which 65 percent are controlled by two companies that are controlled by the prc so there's obvious opportunity to disrupt that and replace that with made in America. And again, we say you know, made in America is a requirement, but it's not sufficient. So we're not just making in America, we're really looking at all the layers down, right? You know, from, from, from uh, uh, the networking to the hardware, the firmware and the chips and addressing all that so that you can actually have zero trust hard for hardware. And you can actually say that this piece of hardware is trustable. And that that's missing in, in the industry today because nobody wants to deal with it. Basically the hardware manufacturers, they make hardware, it's not really their job to be secure unless they're on the very high end, you know, military edge. And the cybersecurity guys say, well, we make software and our investors don't want to even hear about hardware. So not our problem, right? And so here we are. Are the are the business people and the investors like, do they jump on this and go great market opportunity, you know, made in America a fundamental problem? Or do they go, you know, that's that's kind of not where I would put my money. I mean, how hard is it to raise money to do something that is a tectonic shift and is also hardware and is also made in America. Like to me, that sounds like a really miserable ice skating uphill type of exercise. It's, it's, it's been a challenge and it is a challenge, right? And so uh, certainly what it, you know, the way the industry is kind of, you know, in terms of investment is split today, right? Is there software investors, SaaS investors, and Faction Networks is a classic SaaS product, right? I mean, we, we've, we align to every single home run success story of SaaS in terms of who we would sell to, the model, 80% uh, type of margins, highly efficient. So it's a perfect SaaS business. It has this one problem that one, you know, not all of the use cases we're addressing need the hardware, but we want to fundamentally go after this problem of the, the vulnerable devices that are now powering our entire work, live economy, and so on. So we need to have this hardware piece, right? So what we've done to try to attack it is really separate the hardware into a hardware company and be able to go to people that like to invest in hardware, right? And not talk to the SaaS investors. So we actually now formed, formed a joint venture uh, together with a uh, allied nation router OEM, public company, uh, has a very robust, complete set of routers, 
They wanted to enter the U.S. market. We were able to talk to them after a couple months of discussion at the C-suite level and really get them to understand that, you know, they had a much better play to come partner with us and focus on doing something really different. You know, so rather than another cheap Asian box, right, in and in a market flooded with them, let's go create actually zero trust secure routers that are fundamentally, you know, differentiated in the marketplace from everything else is out there. So, so that's how we're approaching it. And yes, I mean, that is it. It's a different set of investors because, yes, I mean, hardware, right, is a high top line, low margin, the, yeah, the more successful you are, the faster, you know, the more capital you need, but then you build, you know, you build the kind of business that two guys in a garage cannot attack, right? So you build a much more robust competitive moat. Yeah. You know, I mean, hardware businesses tend to be much more lasting and durable. So it's a great business, but you know, it's a certain kind of investor that goes after hardware and then software, you know, SaaS is, is yes. Yeah, so we, we built faction with like three guys and my partner and yeah. in our garages and living rooms. And then, you know, as we go forward, yeah. And do our Series A. After that, we probably wouldn't need capital beyond, you know, ARR-based financing. Does this mean that you guys might have one of the few plays in the market that is legit zero trust? Like, because, I mean, I guess there's, someone's going to have the argument of, okay, well, even if you say that you've taken care of the router and the hardware and whatever else, like, you are from running jacked up, dorked up, potentially compromised software in my network, I'm still not zero trusty, but is this just, we have to solve this problem to get to there or what's the next thing? Yeah. Again, what we, what we look at is like, this is, you know, there's no magic bullet or panacea, but right now the way, you know, the industry is approaching it, you've got all, yeah, you know, all the focus is on active and then, you know, the highest active of all now is AI. So let's throw AI on top of everything else. And that's going to solve our problem. And, you know, that's, I think well, it might well, but it's, it's another arms race, right? Of, AI for the attacker and AI for the defender. Yeah, it sounds like, you know, right now what I heard of this conference is a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of progress towards what AI can do. That's fantastic. But the way we look at it is like, if you don't solve this underlying problem, like if you don't go back to the kind of building an actually defensible infrastructure, well, then you've already lost the game before you start it. I mean, literally, if you can't trust the layers at the bottom, then everything else is literally a waste of time. So you got to have both. So we're, we're focused on that part, right? We're focused on kind of layers four and three down to zero, but really securing that in a fundamental way so that you have a, a chance, you know, defense has a chance to defend itself. And that starts by, yes, a faction network is decentralized. That's good. But there's two other characteristics it has that really help. So so one I talked about, it's not addressable. It doesn't publish its addresses. You cannot get to the network from the internet, you can only get to it by being invited over the internet by an out of band off, you know, key exchange so that once you're inside, now you can get around. So, okay, so great. The, the network is not visible nor attackable from the internet. But the other side is that every address, IP address inside a faction network is signed with the certificate of the key of the network owner. So there's no anonymous. There's no, there's none of this kind of getting at the typical network attack, right? As you get inside, you, you, you hunt and you park yourself, you know, you're not visible. You, you watch and monitor, us, yeah. you figure out who's who and who to attack. And, and this goes on for months. That's what you hear is like, you know, they were in there for six months studying everybody before they really attack. You can't do that in a faction network. It, there is no anonymous. Every device, you know, is known. Every user who owns that device is known. Uh, and the minute there's somebody who's not, you know, is doing something unusual, it's going to be detected. So yeah, so we think that that creates a fundamentally secure way to do networking without having to get rid of the internet. We can't get rid of it, right? We have to build an overlay, but an overlay allows people to start to fundamentally, you know, kind of secure networking, kind of one network at a time, and then they start to reconnect them. And over time, this approach can kind of effectively replace all the internet. I mean, we think for the most part, the internet's going to become unusable because it is so dangerous, right? And so most people are going to spend most of their time in private networks connected to other private networks, right? Which are, oh yeah, no, and on, no, none of those kind of characteristics of the internet, they all have to go away because that's not, not the way you can build anything defensible. What a world we built the internet for openness and interoperability and everything else. And then human being humans done what they did and have ruined it. And now we're going back to the model of everybody having their own private. So last. Last question is like when the PRC gets wind of what this is and how you're doing it, how are you guys going to keep PRC agents and other folks from getting, you know, slipping their little tentacles into your process? Yeah. So, so I think two things, right? I mean, right. We, what we know is that, and, and part of our premise as a business for investors is simply that, you know, what has kind of been the, the de facto, you know, good enough security for the last two decades. It's just not going to hold. I mean, we, we literally know that the PRC, you know, the, the FBI, head of the NSA, tested in front of Congress, been on 60 Minutes, letting us know that 
you know, everywhere we look, we find bull typhoon everywhere. They're not there like probing for vulnerabilities. They're there and planting code. And then that code is examined. It's there to execute very destructive you know, purposes. And that a articulated part of our war fighting strategy is to kneecap our society and our economy, right? So we know that's what we're heading towards, you know, and whether it's a PRC or something else, right? We're heading toward an era where, yes, this kind of rickety infrastructure of security we built is just not going to last. But we as a company think, okay, Zero Trust Security has two aspects to it. There's one is kind of what we do. And then we also need a new model for kind of enforcing Zero Trust Security, ongoing monitoring. So we're partnered with the Air Force Research Lab program called Orion, which is out of Rome, New York. And they are, you know, first and foremost, a, a focus on OT and IoT security. So they're, they're trying to provide a model of no longer like, I swear I'm secure scouts honor, but no, we'll test mm -hmm. and let you know if you're secure, right? That's good, but what we've talked about them, you know, that's needed and they agree that as we go forward, they want to kind of, you know, spin themselves out and become an underwriter's lab, if you will, of OT and IT security. What we've said is, hey, it has to be ongoing, right? Because, you know, you, ca you cannot take a snapshot of a router that you submitted and say, well, it was secure in January, 2023. Yeah. What about, you know, March, 2023? I mean, things change constantly. So you have to have, yeah, ongoing monitoring and, and the ability to say, okay, we as a manufacturer, we as a solution provider are willing to be held accountable so that when there's a CVE or something that's affecting, you know, our product, the first person to know will be our customer, right? And now what happens is it's published by you know, some database that nobody looks at other than the people that want to attack you. Uh, it's ignored by the manufacturer, right? It goes on for months. Everybody gets hacked and then, then, then finally gets bad enough, somebody fixes it. And we're saying, hey, the model has to be changed that, that, you know, we have to have accountability and that this model of saying that we're not going to just kind of pretend that hardware is secure, we're going to make sure it's secure uh, is critical because it's, you know, I guess the last thing I would close on is this analogy. If you think of food, right, when you open a jar of peanut butter, uh, you have every right to expect it won't kill you, right? And unless you're allergic to peanut butter. Unless you're allergic to peanut butter. Which you shouldn't be open it anyway. Yeah, that's, your, that's bad on you. But whatever it might be, that yeah. if you look at the food you know, manufacturing, there's a whole set of both regulation and inspection and really attention to ensure that we have fundamentally safe a food supply in this country. Mm. We have to have the same approach to this kind of digital hardware, right? Because it's a different category. It's not, the, it's not like clothing or things like that. This is stuff that brings systemic risk into our whole economy, our whole society. So we have to change as a country. And obviously we believe, well, that was a time of great change. And this is the opportunity of both investors and, and engineers and people to come along with us and, and try to make a difference, right? Because this, this cannot last the way we're working now. That's totally agree. Well, folks, if you're out there listening to this, look up Faction Networks, Jeff Halstead. Thanks for coming on. And, uh, you know, Best of luck. You guys are trying to solve a fundamental problem with the internet and security. So, and thank you for having me.